between our usual Tuesday hangout and a formal uh, monthly meeting. Really, the distinction is largely semantic. Um, but Rob has agreed, spurred by some people who have had some very interesting questions in the past, to give us a real basic introduction to the various ways in which astrophotography can be done. Um, from as simple as slapping a cell phone onto a daub to, you know, one of the very, very complicated, what I call spaghettified, um, you know, uh, setups that, you know, allow people to do some very, very advanced photography with, with some really stunning results. Um, so per a usual, you know, monthly meeting, formal monthly meeting, a uh, couple of, I hate the word use word ground rules, but to keep the meeting, you know, clean and efficient, what we will do is we're going to go ahead and mute everybody um, just to keep the audio chain um, as clear as possible when Rob is talking. If anyone has a question, what I would encourage is I will be monitoring the chat uh, window. So if people have questions for Rob, I would encourage to simply put the question in there. Um, and at an appropriate moment, I can either interrupt, interrupt Rob to ask the question um, or, you know, we'll just kind of play it by ear. If you need to ask the question directly, if you're on a cell phone or something where the chat is not as convenient, by all means, just we're trying to keep the chatter um, as low as possible to allow Rob's audio to come through as clearly as possible. Um, the other heads up is Rob will be, well, Rob is uh, recording this meeting. So just a heads up to anybody, for everybody, that meeting is being recorded. Um, <clears throat> other than that, any questions before we jump into this? Rob, it's all yours, man. All right, so first I'm gonna mute everybody. I'm gonna do that first. Hopefully that just worked. All right, next I'm gonna share the screen. All right, and that should be good. So basically what I'm gonna be doing this evening is doing a really basic introduction to astrophotography. Uh, this isn't meant to be a really advanced talk. Uh, we're not going to get into any details about like how using this method or that method can improve your astrophotography and reduce the noise to acceptable levels and not going to get into the science of it or anything. We're just going to simply explain how can you do astrophotography? What can you do? Um, so to start off, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got started in astrophotography. So the very beginning back in 1996, 1997, when I was in high school, I actually did some astrophotography with a film DSLR. I did some things in black and white, did some things in color. Uh, it was really basic compared to what I do today, but it definitely worked. What you see here, is one of my very first astrophotos. This is a photo of comet Hale-Bopp. Um, it has two tails, as you can see, the ion tail and the, the dust tail. And you can see it was between a couple of trees in Knoxville, Tennessee, when I was on a vacation. It looked really cool, so I had to set my camera down on a tripod. I was out for a walk and gave it a shot, and it came out pretty good. I did several pictures um, in addition to this, but this is the one that came out the best. You will notice there's kind of a strange anomaly, kind of a halo-like shape. That's an internal reflection coming from a nearby light. I think it actually looks really cool, so I left it just included just the same. Um, ever since then, I've kind of had the astrophotography bug, so for many, many years since then. So to get started, you can image the sky with some very cheap stuff. Your images will be very different from the ones that I get with the more advanced setups, but you can get some really good images just with really basic stuff. I have here a basic DSLR camera. Um, a DSLR camera just simply put on top of a tripod like this one can give you really great wide field images um, it's really easy for somebody to get started by doing that because you don't need a ton of equipment. You just literally just take your DSLR that you have for other purposes, slap it on a tripod, and open the shutter for a little while. Now, there are a couple of caveats. Uh, one of them is that you should 
uh, have some kind of cable release. I have here uh, the cable release that I've used for years. And basically what happens is you can either press this button and slide it up and it opens the shutter as long as that button's pressed, or this one's more advanced, you can press these little buttons to set it so that it automatically takes an exposure every now and then. Like, and you can set the interval, you can set the amount of time for each exposure, um, and that's called an intervalometer. But you can also use just a real basic cable release with a sliding button. This one has both. Um, you can also use certain cameras. They have settings in them. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Um, no, maybe not. That's nah, not working. Well, anyway, if you have a camera like mine, you can actually set an interval that you want the exposures to be taken and it'll just start taking images. So I can set this to take a 10 second image and just repeatedly do that until I turn the camera off. So it can be its own intervalometer. Also, this camera is capable of taking more than a 30 second picture in a special setting in the menu settings. Most DSLRs are limited to 30 seconds um, with their internal settings and you need a cable release if you want to do longer. So what is this kind of photography good for? Well, this is Comet Neowise. Uh, this is fresh off the presses. I did this two days ago in my front yard. Um, I did it with a wide angle lens. Uh, I think I was using, actually, actually no, I think I was using this lens. This is a Rokinon 85 millimeter lens right here. I believe I was using that for it. I have to check. I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, I was using an ISO about 1600 and I stacked 546 exposures together, all two seconds a piece to produce that image. So it actually took quite a few images to manage to get that kind of detail out of this comet. But a DSLR on a tripod is really great for something big and broad like this. It's also great for meteors because for a meteor, you can open the shutter and just wait. And hopefully in the time that the shutter is open, a meteor will go through the image. And you can just do that over and over and over. And after a while of doing it, you'll get lucky and you'll have a meteor shot, hopefully like this one. Uh, this one was in Colorado. Um, it was above a beautiful lake, uh, Grand Lake in Colorado. And it was about a 40 second exposure so you could see the Milky Way. Unfortunately, there were some clouds, but I think they kind of add to the picture. Uh, one of the first things that I did in astrophotography was I just took photos of the constellations and then I looked at the constellations and looked them up in books and that's how I actually learned the sky. You know, most people go out, they look up, they take a book and they learn the sky that way. Unfortunately for me, um, I couldn't see the sky that well with the glasses that I had before. Uh, now I have contacts and I can see the sky very well but I really couldn't see the stars as well just looking up at the sky. So I had to take photos of the sky in order to see the stars in order to learn the constellations. Um, but when I got to be 18, I got contacts and I've never looked back. They really um, have made the sky so much more beautiful. All the stars are pinpoints now and I can clearly see the constellations. I really couldn't before. So a couple of tips. If you want to image the night sky with a DSLR and camera lenses, like I'm talking about here, you want to set a fairly high ISO. Now by fairly high, what I mean is not 100, not 200, more like 1600 or 6400 or something like that. You want to get that gain up high enough that you get over the noise of the camera, that you get a signal coming in from the sky that's significantly above the noise level. That's your goal. Um, do note that the higher you make the ISO, the smaller the dynamic range becomes. So there is a negative to increasing the gain too much. But I would say an ISO 
setting somewhere around 1600 is usually pretty good. Um, what I would also say is take a photo and view it on the back of your camera and see how the photo looks in the histogram. Because what you'd like to see is a decent amount of exposure and you don't want to see that you're saturating your pixels. You don't want to have lost some of your information. And you also don't want it to be too dark. So the cool thing about today's DSLRs, you can take a photo, immediately look a look at the back, and you can tell if your exposure looks good, if it's trailing too much, if the histogram looks okay. You can tell all that stuff just by taking a test photo and seeing how it looks. Um, another note is that you can use the live view feature on a number of these DSLRs to focus. I didn't add that there, but I just thought of it. It's a very useful trick because the stars show up in the live view and you can focus on them. So that's a really great advantage of today's DSLRs over the film cameras that I used many, many years ago. Um, also note that if you have a smaller number of millimeters, a wider, field of view, basically, in your lens, you can take longer exposures because the apparent trailing of the stars in your image will be much smaller. So you can take a longer exposure before it looks too bad. But as I said, take a photo, see how it looks. And if you're not bothered by the trailing of the stars, you're good. Um, you can tell real quick if you're comfortable with it. Another note is that a number of lenses do have some optical issues. If you stop them down just a little bit, in other words, don't do like f1.4, do f2.8 or something like that, do f4, it depends on the lens, but don't shoot wide open because they do have some optical defects and that gets away from those defects. Um, another note is that you want to carefully look at the specs for whatever camera lens you plan to use. Um, I really highly recommend something like this Rokinon. It's manual focus and manual um, f-stop. So you got to turn these things manually. There's no, nothing automated about it, but it gives you pinpoint stars and great results. So I would recommend something like that. Um, you can look up the details about how much distortion, chromatic aberration, and other optical issues these lenses have on DxO Mark um, and a number of other sites that review the lenses. They give all kinds of technical details. There are some advantages to a DSLR and tripod, very little equipment, easy to set up and take down. Limited exposure time is a disadvantage because if you take a five minute exposure, it's gonna be horribly trailed. Um, and it's just not gonna look very good. So that leads you to the thought that, well, maybe I want a sky tracker that will track the sky, allow me to take my 10 minute exposures or whatever you want to take. So here's a real basic sky tracker. So this sky tracker simply mounts right on top of the mount. You just screw it on there. And then you can use the ball head that you have from your tripod, like I have here. You can screw that onto the sky tracker, oops, well that's not very good. There you go. And then you can mount your camera in the shoe right there. And basically what the sky tracker will do is it tracks the sky using its internal motor. And it's a very compact device that you can easily take on airplanes and things like that. So that you can take this to remote sites. This is a, a way that I imaged a comet the other day as well. Um, the first way, like I mentioned, was putting the camera directly on the tripod. I did image the comet like that. That was the image I showed you. But I also did another image of the comet using this. I haven't finished processing that yet, though. So don't know yet. A big advantage to using the sky tracker is, of course, that you can take much longer exposure times. Uh, a disadvantage to a sky tracker is that the ground will trail. So whereas the stars trailed with the regular tripod, the ground will trail with this, unfortunately. 
Here is an image that I took a few years ago in the Tetons. Uh, this is landscape astrophotography. Basically, it tracked the sky and the ground did trail, but it didn't trail too much. Um, not enough to be offensive. If you look at it carefully, you'll notice that the trees are a little bit blurry because they move during the exposure effectively, but it's okay, I think. I think it looks all right like that. Here's another example of something you could do. Um, this one was just up the road at Cheslin. Um, on this one, the trailing of the trees in the image was really bad. You might notice down there at the bottom some of the residual trees that I had trouble cropping out, but I took most of the trees out of this image because they were terrible. Uh, but do note that you can see all kinds of really dim nebulosity in this image. Uh, you can see some nebulas that I didn't even know existed before I took this image, like this big one right over here. It's enormous, but it's so dim that we never ever see it. Um, you can see all the stuff around Antares there. You can see all the nebulae in the Milky Way that are in Sagittarius. It's very nice. So you can do that just by simply taking your DSLR or your SBIG camera, which I did in this case, mounting it on a sky tracker and leaving the exposure for a while, leaving it open for a while. And if you take a whole bunch of those images and you stack them, it'll become much better. Here's another one that I did. Uh, this was from my yard at home last year. Uh, this image is kind of remarkable because I shot it through terrible clouds. Um, the clouds were just roaring overhead. There were clear spots and then not clear spots and clear spots. And it was just awful. So what I did was I took 100 hydrogen alpha photos with my SBIG camera slapped on top of this and then I stacked all of them. And it actually helped quite a bit. If you looked at any individual picture, it was just terrible. But by stacking all those images together, I essentially eliminated all the clouds and got a decent result in the end. Uh, but you should see in this image, the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula and a number of other nebulas that are a lot dimmer around the edges. Again, this was just in my front yard not real fancy equipment, real simple. Just a lot of pictures. So a couple of tips and tricks. Um, again, you want to set a fairly high ISO, 1600 at least, I would say. Um, as I said before, the ground is likely to trail. There are a couple of ways to deal with that. You can crop out the ground, as I mentioned before from that one image. You can keep the image short enough that it's not bothering you like I did with the cabin image. Um, or you can do a composite image like I did with the other image that I showed you earlier of Comet Neowise. I took the comet, processed it with 546 images stacked, and then I combined it with a couple of images stacked together of the background. So you do a composite image, you take care of the fact that each one is gonna be trailed, and you have the comet nicely untrailed, and you have the background nicely untrailed, just stuck together into one image. I can go you back. Mean foreground, and Rob. What's that? You mean foreground? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's foreground. So if you look here, these trees, that was a stack of about 20 pictures. And you look at the comet, that was a stack of 546 pictures. Yeah, the trees are foreground, is what I meant to say. Get to the right spot here. Okay. As I said before, you don't really want to shoot wide open, like a couple of stops down. You need to look up on DxO Mark or another site as to what your lenses can actually handle. Um, you want to use a decent lens. Something like this, as I mentioned before, is just as good. Uh, advantages to using a sky tracker. It's still pretty little equipment. You do have the addition of the sky tracker, but it's really not that big. It does fit in your luggage. You can take it on trips. That's actually why I bought it. Um, it is fairly easy to set up. 
there's a little extra work. You got to take your tripod apart and attach this ball head on top of this and then this on top of the tripod, but that really takes very little time. The hardest thing about using the sky tracker is you have to align it to Polaris using the little polar scope. Not that difficult, but does take a couple minutes. Um, of course, as I said before, the ground will trail if you're tracking the sky, but it's okay if you have a way to get around it, as I mentioned. Another thing that you can do is take images with your cell phone. So I have here my cell phone, and I have here a little device that attaches onto your eyepiece. And basically what happens is you take your cell phone and you pop it in to this little thing, and then you can adjust using these little settings how it should line up with the eyepiece until it's lined up just right. Hey, let me turn that on so you can actually see what's happening. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, there you go. But you can actually see the image through the eyepiece and you can line up the cell phone with that by just turning the little dials on this thing. It holds the cell phone very well and it's fairly easy to use. Um, I did use this the other day uh, to show some of the neighbors some images of the moon. Uh, that was when the moon was out and uh, it worked quite well. We got some socially distanced views of the moon's craters and they were nicely zoomed in. I put it on my daub, it was very nice. So I would recommend it during this time of COVID. So other advantages, just about everybody has a cell phone. So like if you're at an outreach event, showing people views through your telescope and they're like, I'd like a picture of that. You could say, oh, well I have this device that you can strap your cell phone into and you can take a quick picture. And usually the people are fairly good at using their cell phone, but you do have to be able to use it very effectively to set the exposure using the little slider when you push on it. And you've got to set, you got to lock the focus so that it doesn't change as well. So you do have to be very familiar with the settings on the camera, on the cell phone. And unfortunately it's a little bit tricky and not immediately intuitive. But if they're really comfortable and know their cell phone well, it'll work just fine. You should note that you can use your cell phone to image the planets. You can use it to image the moon. And if you have a white light solar filter on your telescope, you can use it to image sunspots. Now, let's and say- Rob, yeah. Just, uh, just for, how much do those little cell phone doodads cost? $25. Yeah. They're cheap. Good? Okay. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is how you can image the planets or planetary nebulae. Bob Troublecock was talking about this just a few minutes ago during our astronomy workshop time. So if you want to image the planets, you do need to have a telescope. You can't just set your DSLR on a tripod and try and take a picture of the planets. There's just not enough magnification. The planets have a very small angular size, uh, at least in our atmosphere. So you do have to be sure to magnify it quite a bit in order to get any decent image. So you can do this using a refractor. You can do it using a daub. There's a number of different scopes that you can use for this purpose, but you do need a telescope. Do you need to track the sky? No. Actually, I've done images of the planets using my daub quite a few times. Because you're shooting a movie and because the frame rate is very high, it doesn't matter that it's not tracking the sky because you're taking really short exposures. So the slight movement between each frame, it doesn't make a difference. And it can actually help because it'll blur out any imperfections in your camera um, or dust specks or issues that you have in your optics. So in some senses, it's actually preferred. Um, but do note that I've gotten the best results for imaging the planets with a planetary camera. And I'm gonna demonstrate that real quick, hold on.
So here's a really basic planetary camera. They're not very expensive. This isn't like your DSLR prices. These things are like $200, um, $160 or more depending on the model you get. Uh, it doesn't have to be a ZWO, but I tend to like them. But um, any cheap planetary camera work just fine. So the reason that these are desirable and the reason they're better for this than a cooled CCD or better than the DSLR, there's a couple of them. The first thing that makes these better is that they have a really, really, really high frame rate. You know, my DSLR can take movies, but it can only do about 24, 30 frames per second, at most 60 frames per second, depending on the DSLR. This thing can do 500 frames per second. So it can do quite a few more. Now, it's cheap in comparison to the DSLR. The DSLR is several thousand dollars. This, 200 bucks, 160 bucks, depending on the model. Um, if you get the monochrome version, you'll have a little bit of a problem because you've got a black and white image of the planets and you need filters in order to turn it into color. One shot color like this one you'll have a better chance of imaging planets because you're just going to have to take one picture instead of a bunch. So I would recommend a one-shot color planetary camera for imaging the planets. Um, you can use different programs to do it. Fire Capture is the one that I use. Uh, there are a number of people that use SharpCap, and there's a number of other programs out there as well. Uh, basically, these programs give you a lot of great control over the different camera settings in order to produce the best result. Uh, you do want fairly high magnification. Um, I've used my DAB, like I said, which has pretty high magnification to begin with. Um, but you might also want to put in um, like a PowerMate or a Barlow or something else like that in order to magnify it even more. You have to experiment with it to see what's best. Uh, do note also, again, you want to take movies, movies with lots and lots of frames that are very, very short. You'll be stacking the best frames of that movie to produce the best result. I have here some images of some different things that I've taken using this method. Uh, top left, you can see Saturn. Uh, I think the bands are pretty well pronounced and the ring structure looks pretty good as well. This was Venus earlier this year. Looked pretty good, but it was going down into the trees, so it's a little bit blurred. Uh, bottom left is something that I've been trying recently. Uh, I hadn't done it years ago, but I just started doing it fairly recently. It's planetary nebulae. Not uh, seeing your images. What's that? Well, we're not seeing your images, I don't think. You can't see this? I see I you. See him, Rob. What's that? I can see them. I'll do it again. Can you see it now? Let's see. Um, I Rob, see I it. can see them. Confirming I can see them. Okay. Yeah, I you see, see five images of planets. Well, one of them is a planetary nebula, but you know. Okay, thank you. You good? Yep. Okay, so as I was saying, um, the image on the bottom left is the blue snowball. Uh, it was an experiment I tried a couple years ago and it worked very well. So because the planetary nebula is pretty much compact and bright like a planet is, the same techniques that you use for the planets can work very well for planetary nebulae and you can get all kinds of crazy details in them just like you can get on the planets. So it's definitely worth trying. In the middle, you can see Mars when it was at opposition, and you can see Jupiter to the right of that. And you can see one of its moons in a moon shadow. Oops, there you go. Next thing I wanna talk about is imaging the sun. Now, huge caveat I have to say before we start any discussion about imaging the sun, you need to have filters. Please, God, don't put your camera on your scope and point it at the sun and take a photo. That would be just terrible. If it starts smoking, <laughs> that's like a $2,000 fire. All right, so you do need to have filters. If you're using your DAB, you can use a white light solar filter like this. Uh, this is very cheap to make. I made this several years ago and it still works today. 
Uh, it's made out of cardboard and Bader solar film. And uh, it works very well. We've had a couple workshops on how to make these and we can certainly do it again. Uh, we do have some material. Uh, I have some and Bob Troublecock has some, several other people have some in the club. We can definitely help you make your solar filters and you can make them any size. Here's a, another model that I make. I made this for my camera lens when the solar eclipse was going on because I wanted to capture the beginning and end of the eclipse with my um, long 600 millimeter lens. And so I made this out of wood, as you can see. I don't know how well you can see that. Yeah. And we can definitely show you how to do those things. Uh, another option would be something like a quark solar eyepiece, as they call it. I just recently acquired one of these, and so far my results have been spectacular. It's very nice. Uh, you can also get a Coronado or Lunt solar telescope or some other brand, um, and those are specifically just for uh, photographing the sun in hydrogen alpha light. The quark solar eyepiece can be used on any refractor up to um, 80 millimeters without a UV IR filter and up to 120 millimeters if you put a UV IR filter on it. Uh, so what I've been using it on, I'll demonstrate real quick. I've been using it on this 120 millimeter scope. It's the Orion 120 millimeter F5. Uh, do note that you should only use it on like an air spaced telescope, not on an oil spaced telescope. The very first um, thing that focus light should hit is the UV IR cup filter. Um, basically what I did, let me get this off of here. What I did is I mounted a UV IR cup filter right before my diagonal. So the very first thing that the sunlight will hit is this. You really, really, really do not want to put this cork eyepiece on something like this Newtonian telescope here. Because if you did that, concentrated light would strike the secondary mirror up here and melt it. So highly recommended that you follow their advice and only use it on an airspace refractor or get an energy rejection filter to put on the front of the scope. They do um, make an energy rejection filter that will allow you to use it with schmidt cassegrains as well. Okay. Here is an image that I took with the white light solar filter right here on my 10 inch daub. Uh, it was during one of the transits of Mercury that we recently had, and we also had some nice sunspots at the same time. And you can see some of the granulation of the sun. Uh, that's all this pattern here that you see. Uh, so you can actually image that just with a really cheap solar filter. Here is the transit of Venus from 2012. This is actually a video. Because as I mentioned before, if you image with video, you can improve your image quite a bit because you can align and stack the best frames of the video. So I was taking video of the sun in order to try and do that. And it just happened that an airplane flew across the sun at that time. It was very exciting. Uh, this is one of the images that I recently took with the quark. Um, do note that I used not this ZWO, but my monochrome ZWO. I found that I got the best results imaging the sun in hydrogen alpha light with a monochrome CCD or CMOS camera, I mean. I did not get great results with this one shot color camera, and I also did not get good results with the DSLR. I tried both. I was not happy with the results because when you're getting monochromatic light, coming into the camera and you've got a Bayer filter in front of the CCD or CMOS uh, sensor, 
that is absorbing most of the light that's coming, like the green filter and the blue filter do, you're kind of wasting pixels. So basically with this camera and this camera, only a small fraction of the pixels are actually recording any information. So when I looked at the images that came back when I tried these, I was not happy with the results. It just had really low resolution and it just, it just looked awful. I would highly recommend a monochrome camera. The um, monochrome ZWO work really, really well, as you can see here. Uh, do note, it is a monochrome camera. The color is my own addition. I uh, just played around in the processing and made it these colors. Likewise, I did the same thing here with the prominences and the surface of the sun. So also note that there is a huge difference between the brightness of the surface of the sun and the brightness of the prominences that are coming up off the sun. I had to do a composite image in order to combine these two exposures of different lengths. Um, so you can kind of get hints of the prominence when you're exposing for the surface, but nothing like you see here. You really have to have two different exposures to get a, a good result. So I just mentioned a minute ago, the prominences and the surface have a very different exposure time. You do want to shoot movies. As I said before, you want to use like a monochrome CMOS camera, like not this one, but the other one. Uh, you want to use something like fire capture or sharp cap, uh, which I mentioned before for the planets. And just like the planets, you're shooting movies, not still images. Um, nice, fast sensor. Uh, worked much better, as I said, than something like a DSLR. And it's way cheaper than the DSLR to begin with. Uh, one issue that I found when I started using it was I was getting Newton's rings, basically an interference pattern in my image caused by reflecting monochromatic light in my image train. Here was my solution. Literally, it's just tilting the sensor. So I put my ZWO on the back of this, put this into the uh, back of this quartz solar eyepiece. And when you attach them together, it has maybe about an eight degree tilt. And that was enough to get rid of Newton's rings. Worked quite well. But do note, it's a very common problem that solar imagers have. Uh, I just didn't know about it until I got it. And I was like, what the heck are those rings? <laughs> All right, but I did solve the problem. Now, I didn't mention this in my promo for the talk, but I thought I would add it. Uh, if you want to image the International Space Station, there are a couple of options for that. Uh, one of the things you can do is use a satellite tracking software. Uh, there's a very nice one that I've been using called uh, sattrack.exe. Um, you can find it at uh, heavenscape.com, I believe. I have to check that website. Sorry, I should put that here. Um, you can also use some prediction software and try and wait till it transits in front of the moon or the sun and image it that way. And that's the one I'm going to talk about here. Uh, you can use websites like transitfinder.com and there are several others as well that take your latitude, your longitude, and the orbital elements in the International Space Station and calculate when you can see transits on the moon and the sun and from what locations. Uh, Nico Carver uh, let us know about this a couple years ago in 2016 and gave us a little heads up and we all headed over to Bill Hannigan's house uh, because his backyard was right in the track where we'd be able to see this. So we, had, we went over to his house and gave it a shot. I set up my 10 inch DOM, I used my DSLR and I shot a movie. Um, I then took the frames of the movie and enhanced them. And these are the frames when it actually was passing in front of the moon. Do note that the total time was about 0.7 seconds. So you really have to be taking movie a movie, you really have to be on the moon before it happens 
it's just a blink of an eye. I actually saw it in the live view on the back of the sensor, on the back of the camera. I saw it go, whoosh. it was just a little black speck raced across the image. And I was like, whoa, I guess that was it. But then when I went back and processed it, there was all kinds of detail, as you can see. You can see the solar panels, you can see the station. It was pretty cool. And I also put it together into a little composite image. You can see these are all the frames in which the station was and um, where it was at that point. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is doing deep sky astrophotography with a telescope. And this is something that I've liked to do for years and years. I first did it, I guess, in college. I attempted to do this when I was back in high school. I don't even want to show you the results. It was, it was terrible. I got much better at it when I was in college using a large observatory telescope. It was a 24 inch, um, what was it? It was a 24 inch made by DFM Engineering. It's a very nice scope. Um, of course, after I left college, I no longer had access to that. And the next time I did decent deep sky astrophotography was like 2008. So there was a gap of almost 10 years um, between when I first did astrophotography and when I really started doing it. So a couple of key points. The mount is incredibly important for doing deep sky astrophotography. It's way more important than the telescope. I come over here. This telescope that you see that I do most of my imaging with is $300. It's dirt cheap. And I can replace that and put this telescope on top of that mount. No problem. The thing is, your mount is something that'll be with you for a while, and you can use that for many different um, imaging trains, different imaging rigs, different telescopes, different optics. But you really need to have a good mount. You need to have a mount that tracks the sky very well. Because if you take a five minute exposure through a telescope and it trails, you're just gonna have this ugly blur. So you wanna make sure that it tracks well enough that it can get you good results for what you're trying to image. Of course, if your mount does trail a little bit, you can shorten your images, but I think it's kind of crazy to spend a lot of money on a mount and then have it giving you bad results and have to limit the exposure time just to make up for that. Um, do note that if your mount is not giving great results, you can guide using a separate telescope attached to the sky to your soap. I have here a guide scope attached to the side with a camera. I don't know how you can see that, but there's another ZWO right here. And this scope basically takes an image of a star, which tells the mount if it's getting off track a little bit. And it will correct the mount to put it back on track to keep it on the thing you're trying to image so that the main sensor up here at the top can actually get good results. So even if your mount is okay, you can still get good results. But I would highly recommend invest as much as you can into the original mount so that you can get the best results you can get. I would highly recommend that you make sure that your mount can handle probably at least twice the uh, weight of your equipment. So if your mount has a capacity of 60 pounds, you should only put like 30 pounds on it. If your mount can handle 120 pounds, put 60 pounds on it. And you'll be much happier because if the mount isn't struggling, it's going to produce better results. Do note that you still want to take those long exposures, but you still want to stack the results. I'm just going to show you a couple of results that I got from doing these kinds of techniques. Uh, here's an image I just did like two days ago. This is the Eagle Nebula. I took this at my house using my S-Big camera attached on this scope that I just showed you. And I did a number of exposures in red, green, and blue, 10 each, stacked them up and got that result. Here's an image of the Veil Nebula from a couple years ago. Uh, this one, had 18 H alpha and 18 O3. 
uh, all five minutes a piece. I also did this at my home. This is the Horse Head Nebula um, shot in 2018. Uh, an interesting point is this image I took at the very end of the evening when I was packing up. I was mainly there to take images of a galaxy. And uh, this image, even though it was a really short uh, number of exposures, came out way better than the image that I took of the galaxy. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a great image and I'll, I'll keep this one much more than I keep the one of the galaxies. Here is an image of the Pelican and the North American Nebula. Uh, the Pelican I took at Mount Cube Observatory. I basically took the telescope that you saw over here uh, down to Mount Cuba and I imaged the Pelican uh, from inside the library. And then the one on the right I did during one of our AP SIGs, I did that at Rick Spencer's house. Uh, this is the Rosette Nebula. I did that one at home, 8H alpha and 803 images and they were five minutes a piece as well. So you'll notice I do tend to take about five minute exposures when I'm doing deep sky photos. I find that five minutes is a reasonable amount for the amount of noise that you get, and you're less likely to get planes and satellites going through it. I find if I do 10 or 15 minute images, some of them get ruined. Um, whereas the five minute image, if one gets ruined, it's only five minutes lost. So I find that's a good compromise. This Are is there any downsides of doing five minute images, Rob? Say it again. Are there any downsides of doing a five minute image over a 15 minute image or a oh, hour absolutely. long image? If you take a 10 minute or a 15 minute long image, you can greatly improve your signal to noise ratio. You can get much better results if you can do that. But you know, it's diminishing returns as well. Like there's a huge advantage to doing five minutes over one minute. There's a smaller advantage over doing 10 minutes versus five minutes. And there's an even smaller advantage to 15 over 10. See what I'm saying? Yeah, is it, thank you. Is it offset or can you mitigate those losses that you were talking about there between five, 10 and 15 and 20 if you stack your images? Yes and no. Stack? So different types of noise. Uh, if you, <laughs> take like a gajillion one minute images, you can kind of correct for some of the error, but not all of it. Um, it is actually better to do uh, fewer images that are longer than it is to take many images that are shorter. But in certain cases, it actually works out in your favor to do the really short ones. When I did Comet Neowise the other day, I did two second images and I did 546 of them. Now, why did I do that? Well, it's because if I tried to do longer ones here, they would have saturated the camera because the brightness of the sky is too large. So I wouldn't have been able to take even a 20 second image. It just would have been too long. So in that case, you absolutely have to shorten your images and take more of them. So it would be best if we could take five minute images or 10 minute images or hour long images if we could, but it's sometimes just isn't possible. Thank you. Yep. This is one I did at Coil Field a few years ago, um, 2015, uh, basically 10 R, 10 G, and I guess 11 blue, interesting. Uh, they were two minutes a piece. I used to do two minutes because I didn't have my guiding all worked out. And I find that my mount can do okay when you take images that are like two minutes, maybe even three minutes uh, without guiding. But if I wanna do the five minute images, I have to guide. Uh, this one I actually did at Mount Cuba with our new telescope. I mounted my camera on the back of it. And uh, this is the result I got. This is the elephant's trunk nebula. All right, so that's just a few examples. I wasn't going to get too in depth into the details. Do note that there are a couple of different kinds of cameras you can get. As I said before, 
you got this type, which is again what they call a planetary camera. This planetary camera can take many, many images very quickly. So it's great for planets, it's great for solar, it's great for lunar, but not as good for deep sky astrophotography. This camera over here, that's my S big. It is a cooled camera. It is really great for taking long exposures, but it is terrible at taking really short exposures. It really can't take images less than about five seconds. If I, if I try to take an image shorter than that, bad things happen. It doesn't come out good. Um, the DSLR is kind of good at both, but not as good as the other two I just mentioned. So the reason I would use a DSLR typically is because the DSLR is something you already have. It's not the best at either one, but it can do both kind of well because it's got video modes for doing the planets, it can take very short exposures, and it can take very long exposures. So it can kind of do all of them. Um, in terms of guiding, uh, you do need a computer in order to do that. So if you want to have an automated focuser, you want to have guiding going on, or all these more advanced things going on, that's a whole other level. But it greatly improves your results if you do. So it is worth looking into. I don't want to get too far into talking about all that, simply because this is meant to be a beginner talk, and that's the more advanced concepts. All right, I think I'll stop there and open it up to any questions you guys might have, and I can show you more equipment or answer any questions you have about the stuff I presented. Hey, Rob, just keeping in mind the spirit of a beginner level talk, um, <laughs> Would it be worth taking two or three minutes and just doing a quick tour of all the different bits and pieces in your crazy looking setup? Sure, I can talk about my setup. I wanted to not talk about it as much simply because, you know, it's more advanced, but sure, I'd be glad but to. But just, you know, I mean, I'd say give a quick highlight and maybe what we could do is, I don't know what, like I pinned you so that you're now a prominent image so the details show up better. Maybe, I don't know if there's a way to get everyone to do that, like in presentation mode, but no, um, you have to kind of tell them to do it. So what, what I would encourage everyone to do is somehow figure out in your copy of Zoom, you can either pin Rob or you can switch it to presenter view such that Rob, um, Rob's image or Rob's uh, webcam feed shows up, you know, large. Um, and that way when he shows off the different components, it'll be more prominent than, you know, just looking at one of the little tiles. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, I would like to note again, this is not to scare you guys. This is yeah. the more advanced setup. This is meant to be a beginner talk. I really wanted to focus on how you can get started, but this is where you can go. You know, it's the stuff you can do to produce the ones I showed at the end of the talk. That whole set that I showed at the very end, we're done with this setup, basically. Okay? All right, well, I'll try and go through it real quick. So the first thing, as I said before, the most important is a solid mount. Uh, this mount can hold a really decent amount of weight. It can hold 60 pounds, um, and it can hold it very well. In fact, I've put more than 30 pounds on it, and it still did very well with its imaging. Um, I do have it all set up and ready to go, except it's inside, of course. <laughs> this over here is the control system for it. Um, do note that that's like a computer, basically, that controls them out. It is fully go-to. So like if I was doing visual observing, I could use a hand paddle here, tell it to go to whatever I want to go to. However, I don't do that. I mainly control it with my computer. So that's what I'd like to talk about here. As you can see, there's a cable going up here to this device. This is called the Raspberry Pi. This is basically like a mini computer. It's a $35 computer um, with a USB hub and a power supply and a bunch of things plugged into it, basically. Um, in the end, all these different components here cost maybe around $100 because uh, you got the case and you got the USB hub here and you got um, you know, other bits and pieces. You got a cable going here. I put a more powerful antenna on it because I wanted to get a better signal. 
So, you know, when you add up all those different things, it does add up to a decent amount, but it still is very insignificant compared to a laptop or a big computer. And you don't care so much about a $35 computer if the dude destroys it. You can just get another one. Um, another note is I spent a lot of time earlier uh, this last month making this wooden block that I'm attaching everything to. It used to just be Velcro stuck onto my scope, but I spent a bunch of time on it uh, during this summer, fixing it up and making it nice. Uh, this is the power distribution block that Bob Treblecock recommended. Um, and I decided to switch everything over to Anderson power poles because they're much easier to work with and uh, install, connect, separate, and we're less likely to have issues. Like some of you might know that I actually fried this S big camera a couple years ago by plugging in the cable wrong. <laughs> so uh, yeah, anything that I can do to make it better and not have problems with that would be good. I had to actually send it in for service in order to get that fixed. I can't do that one handed. All right, this here is a Moonlight controller for the Moonlight Focuser, which is right here. So I sit on my computer and I tell the camera to focus. I tell it to do an autofocus. It focuses in, focuses out, analyzes the result, and tries to get the smallest stars, basically, the most focused stars. So I don't have to sit here turning the dial to focus. It automatically focuses. Um, here again is my S-Big camera on the top, which does the actual imaging also controlled by the computer, also controlled from my laptop. So basically, I remotely control this computer on the scope, which controls all the different components on the scope. A Couple of minutes ago, I mentioned there is a guide scope over here. Uh, that is a ZWO camera on the back of a small 50 millimeter guide scope. I think that's called the Orion Mini Guide Scope. Um, it can be any scope. I used to use the Short Tube 80 for that, but found it was kind of heavy and didn't need it. I was just as good with this little 50 millimeter thing. So I switched over to save weight. So let's see, what else? Question. Oh yeah, yes. Um, what's the purpose of using the Raspberry Pi rather than having it controlled directly from your computer? There's a huge advantage. It means that telescope is sitting in my driveway doing the imaging, and I'm sitting in the living room watching a movie. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, a, that's the advantage. Okay. Also, uh, it's quite cross-platform. I can control the Raspberry Pi with any operating system. So the Raspberry Pi is sitting outside controlling all the equipment, and I can be inside using a Mac, a Windows, Linux computer. I can even control it with a tablet. Yeah. Thank well, you. And Rob, I think the other point is that the Raspberry Pi is very small and light. Yes. Technically, you could strap a, a second laptop to the back of your telescope, but that would obviously be much more, you know, a lot more mass for that telescope, to, for the mount to have yes. to swing around. Yes, this is quite a light thing. This is like an astro device, basically. It's very light and it controls everything. In fact, I could automate that. Like I could set up the Raspberry Pi to run the whole session and I could turn my laptop off and walk away. That's the other advantage is it can be a totally self-controlled system. And every now and then I can log in using VNC or some system like that to double check that the imaging session is going okay but I can turn my laptop off if I want to. So I've got a couple options. I can control it from the laptop through the Pi, or I can have the Pi run everything and just turn the laptop off. Thank you. Yep. And then, uh, oh, should talk about this do control over here. So on the other side of this little block, I don't know if you can see this. This is a do buster do controller. Uh, when fairly early in my imaging, uh, when I was going out into the field, when my guider 
got covered in dew, I had to stop. Like, I never really got dew on my primary mirror, my secondary mirror, never really had any problems, but the guide scope was always doing up. And the minute it got dew on it, I had to stop. So it's actually quite important to have a dew heater of some sort. Uh, this one's called the Dew Buster. You don't need anything too fancy like that. It's not controlled by the computer, but you know, you can get any number of different ones that control it quite well. I, I do think that it's critical that whatever dew controller you have uh, doesn't just use resistors, that it uses pulse width modulation in order to save battery. Because you know, when you're in the field, your battery can only do so much. And if you're wasting power on something like that, that's kind of silly. So pulse width modulation is much more efficient than resistive heating. Next thing is down here. This is my power box that I rewired just recently. It's something that I built to provide different types of power. This one here is 18 volts for my mount because it prefers that. This one here is Anderson Power Poles. I just installed this uh, last week. And these are the regular old cigarette lighters. Uh, I had them in before I did the Anderson Power Pole conversion and I just kind of left them. And inside of there is a pyramid power supply. It's nicely contained, keeps the dew out, but also allows ventilation. Let's see if I got everything. I talked about this, talked about that. That's the main stuff. Um, I can also demonstrate my battery box if you like, when I go out in the field. Sound good? Do that real quick. I didn't want to bring it inside. So when I am in the field, this is my power system. I have just installed Anderson power poles here. Uh, this one is 18 volts. And these over here are the regular cigarette lighter uh, connectors. And there's a power switch right there. Turn it on and off. There's a solar charge controller here. So I can connect this thing to solar panels to charge it up. And inside of the box, unplug that, just a second. Out of the box is a 100 amp hour battery. And it's on wheels, so you can drag it out on the field. So hey, Rob, I, got, I got confused. Hey, if that's the battery, what was the thing in the wooden box you just showed us? So the wooden one is if you have electric, so you can plug it into the wall. Oh, oh, okay. That one is if you go out in the field where there is no electric. Hey, Rob. Yep. Question. Yep. Uh, 100 amp hour, uh, amp hour uh, gel pack. Uh, it is a sealed 100 amp hour uh, lead acid battery. That does, okay. Not gel pack, okay. I don't think the other so. question on that uh, for the uh, cameras, that for movies, the software has to, uh, pro, you know, connect up to them to do movies. Will Echoes do that? Uh, I noticed there's a movie thing button on that. Will that do that for the Echoes? Yes, it will. Um, that's new for Echoes. No, it, it's been in there for a while. Well, uh, it hasn't been operating. You know that the frame rate uh, if you're using Ecos is only 30 frames per second. Whereas if you use Fire Capture or Sharp Cap directly connected to the camera, it's uh, up to 500 frames per second. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. all right. So you get a Thank higher you. frame rate. So right. you Thank can you. do it remotely. Like if I took my um, ZWO camera, stuck it on my scope and connected it to the Raspberry Pi, I could get 30 frames per second video. So yeah, you could. It just wouldn't be as good. 
Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank it you. It has to do with uh, the communication protocol and the time it takes it to transmit. Like for the over Wi-Fi, you can't send more than like 30 frames a second. It just won't work. Yeah. Right. Okay. Just, just not fast enough. Right. Other questions? Anyone else have any questions? I'll step in and say that, that that was great. I think you really covered a lot of bases there. Um, I would say maybe if any, you offered a whole lot of different solutions from the you know twenty dollar plastic cell phone, slap it on your telescope dealy to just sticking your SLR on a tripod to a you know several thousand dollar very complex and technically elaborate setup. If if any of those options intrigued anyone and they wanted to know more about it. Um, would certainly encourage uh, them to speak up either during one of our Tuesday workshops or to just email, um, you know, either the, I mean, the groups.io um, and spur some discussion. And then um, the final option is if someone wanted to get kind of beyond the beginner, um, as Rob mentioned at the beginning, the Astrophotography Special Interest Group is quite active um, and is largely made up of, of strong enthusiasts that are quite at an advanced level. So if you just simply wanted to see what that type of stuff was up to, um, the astrophotography SIG is still meeting via Zoom. Um, and, you know, once things get back to normal, uh, we'll, you know, presumably get back to meeting face-to-face -face either at Mount Cuba or at various people's houses that have astrophotography set up. So certainly lots of opportunities for people who wanted to, um, you know, to learn more about any of the topics that Rob uh, presented. Well, what I, what I like is uh, of, uh, if I go out uh, in the middle of nowhere, I want it as simple as possible to use as quickly as I can. Uh, yeah. And that uh, the ro Rokion and the tripod and, and the, uh, the other small um, thing, you know, cheap or small, and quick and simple for the, the uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that uh, feature there. And uh, that would get me out into the, the out in the so-called field, so to speak, more than what I am because I like my observatory, but my area is crap. Like I can barely see Polaris, let alone anything else. But uh, anyhow, I like to go out, but I don't want to be complicated. Yeah, you don't want to forget something critical when you go out. I can say I've had my share of that. I know there was at least one instance that was rather embarrassing when I went to Rick Spencer's house one time, forgot my counterweights <laughs> for the scope. <laughs> you know, if it's a really complicated setup like I have, you know, you can forget things very easily. And there's nothing like how we fixed it with counterweights. Say it again. Well, Rob, do you remember like, how we fixed it? It was excellent. We strapped bricks to it. I was gonna say, there's nothing like improvising counterweights. Yeah. I thought we strapped physics books to it. No, <laughs> bricks. Actually, bricks. you may not remember this, but actually I gave you my counterweights and strapped the books to my telescope. Say what? <laughs> hey Jack, someone finally found a good purpose for books. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Physics books, anyway. Yeah. A, a good solution to that is make lists, make checklists. Yeah, I know. I'm just terrible. Make a checklist, that. put that's, it on the computer. That's way too and, organized and, and forward thinking. Come on. Check it off. <laughs> I'm with you, Tom. I'm a I'm an inveterate list maker. That that's what I do on fishing trips. If I'm going somewhere, uh, I have checklists for different destination fishing trips and uh i just go down through the list so i don't forget stuff totally so my with you. usual plan is i put everything <laughs> like together in a box this is my box to go yeah, just that's, keep that's the things organized idea. in the box if i want to do observing for solar i take this box if i want to do observing for deep sky i take that box yeah but problem is that some things go back and forth between them <laughs> yeah right <laughs> like that zwo that's good for solar but is my guide scope. <laughs> you need an all box. Yeah. yeah. 
Yep, it's crazy. It is interesting, though, uh, even though you can uh, have really simple equipment, you can still get really nice photographs. Oh, yes. And the most important thing I would say is when you buy something that you think you might upgrade later, you might be like, oh, well, this might be a waste of money. So, like, let's say I decided I'm going to buy this planetary camera so that I can get started in astrophotography. And I put this in my scope, I start taking pictures of nebulae, and then I'm like, oh, I really want a cooled camera. I'd like to get an S-Big, or I'd like to get a really advanced, expensive camera. That doesn't mean this one's trash. That's the thing I want to get across. I still use these. I use them for guide scopes. I use them on planets. I use them for solar, <laughs> you know? They're good for other things. Um, just because I upgraded and built this big rig for doing astrophotography <coughs> doesn't mean I never use my tripod. That image I took of the comet was with my tripod and a DSLR. You know, you still go back and use those for specific things. You just need to note that this is better for this and that's better for that. And it works out pretty well. So Rob, I, yeah. I just tuned in. How long were your exposures on your stationary tripod? Two seconds. Okay. There were 546 exposures, two seconds apiece. And what did you stack them in? I stacked them in pics and sight. All right, I'm gonna try that again if we have a clear night or a clear enough night. So you said try that again. Um, you should note, I had a few issues. It took me five tries to get that right. <laughs> what were the issues? Oh, uh, there were a number of issues. I mean, if you already went through it, don't go through it again. No, I didn't. Um, Cause I wasn't focused on that. I was just focused on uh, sharing how you can really simply get started. I wasn't going to go into technical details, okay. but the issues I was having had to do with the fact that, you know, between the different pictures, the comet moves, you know, because it moves amongst the stars. So I had to align all the images and then I had to do a comet alignment after that. And I had to learn how to use the comet alignment tool in PixInsight, which I didn't know how to use. So it took me several tries just to figure out how to use the tool. Okay, I got you. Um, another issue that I had was when I was doing the comet alignment tool, for some reason I had some setting checked that should never be checked. In fact, when I moused over the setting, the little tool tip that pops up says, please don't check this checkbox. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't literally say that, but it's pretty close to that. It says something like, this should never be checked normally. <laughs> I had it checked. <laughs> okay, live and learn. But during those comet exposures, did the comet move significantly relative to the stars? Too much, yes. So, so then when you did the star alignment, the comet was not aligned. That's right. Correct. And then you do the comet alignment after that. I see. Yep. And there's a very nice PixInsight comet alignment tool. I just didn't know how to use it before I started playing with it the other day. And as I said, it took me a few tries to figure it out, but I finally figured out how it worked. I watched a video, helped him figure it out real quick. <laughs> Good. Somebody walked me through it. Other questions? I'm actually thinking of turning that into a nice video of the comet going like this past the trees like I did with some of my other things. Mm. Nice. I did that before with my, um, here, let me show you that video. Just a second. So, I mentioned before that North American nebula shot was a bunch of one minute exposures because there were issues with clouds. I'll show you a little video of how I produced that. Let me share this video, hopefully it works. So this is how I got that image. It came from a whole bunch of very cloudy exposures. 
Now do note that this movie is a compilation of the finished version and the individual cloud versions. I have a second video which shows the original photo. Let me get the original ones. Black and white. Oh. This is the original photos. They're much, much worse. Just a second, clicking around different windows here. Here's the originals. Jeez. You know, in some of these pictures, you can't even see the nebula because the clouds are so thick. And in others, it looks pretty good. You also probably noticed that there were a number of airplanes and satellite trails that went by and a tree that went by as well. But when you stack a whole bunch of pictures together, it eventually works out. All those different imperfections cancel themselves out. Does that look okay? Yeah, very nice. That's amazing. Cool. <laughs> I was thinking I would kind of do that with a comet, kind of show it going down between the trees. But I haven't gotten that far yet. I just finished the stacking of it today. So mm. haven't gotten that far. Other questions? Nice. Hey, I had a question. So yes. when you're using those the planetary camera, how do you focus? Like, you have to like focus it on and then put the camera on or how, do, how does that work? Okay, so with a planetary camera like this one, there's a cable that goes to your computer and you see the view on the screen of your computer live as your okay. image and you can look at it and turn the dial or if you got an automated focuser, press the buttons uh, and you can get a reasonable focus that way. Okay. It's kind of like using the live view on the back of your camera. Other questions? Because I guess, Rob, you would never be using those planetary cameras without a computer, correct? No, you can't. It's not possible. There's no storage? No. OK. No, these, these you need a computer for. That's big you need a computer for, these you need a computer for. The DSLR you have, <coughs> which does mean you have to keep that in mind with your power requirements when you go out in the field. You need to power your laptop. Other questions? It was really enlightening, Rob, thank you. Cool, anything you're, have a question about in any of those different fields I talked about of imaging? I probably have 10 million, but <laughs> By all means. not right now. <laughs> okay. Can come back on a Tuesday night and ask more. Yeah. And the neat thing is you can always try new things. Like I tried not too long ago putting camera lenses on my S-Big camera and it worked very well. Mm -hmm. And I just recently tried the idea of solar imaging with a quark and that worked quite well. So like you're always trying new things. It's not just one field of astrophotography. It's not just deep sky imaging. There's many different things you can do. And maybe you like one thing more than another. In fact, as I said, some of them are much cheaper than others. Like imaging that comet is way cheaper than imaging something like the Cocoon Nebula. Other questions? So you can attach a camera lens to a CCD camera? Is that no. what you said? So here, let me show you. Real quick. Yeah, I don't understand how that works. I guess I didn't talk about any of that. So real quick, this is my S-Big camera. Okay. Um, I changed the little adapter here on the front so that it's a DSLR mount. So like oh. 
most people have a nose piece on here that's like a two inch nose piece. But I wanted to be able to take my Rokinon lens, 85 millimeter, and stick that on here. If I can line it up. And now my wow. SPIG has a camera lens on it. That's awesome. Very cool. Where, yep. Where'd you get that nose piece? Um, I got it from Adorama Camera, I think. <laughs> years and years ago. They do make these things. I have one for my ZWO as well. Yeah, you, you can get the adapters for all those things. Yep, it's definitely all different kinds cool. of cameras. I've got a couple different ones. The other thing you should note is that if you want to put your camera on a telescope, I, I should have talked about this, I guess. Just a second. Move some of these things around. You need something like this. This is a nose piece that's two inch. It goes into a two inch focuser. And you can also get one that's uh, one and a quarter, which I was just looking for and I don't know where it just went. It was here. I don't know. But you can get one that's one and a quarter or two inch that'll fit on the front of your camera. And you would definitely need that in order to do any imaging. Hey, Rob. Yes. What kind of imaging could you do with one of those um, disposable cameras like people used to put on the tables at weddings? You mean the ones that go click, click, <laughs> click, click, click? <laughs> yeah. Um, not very much. I can't <laughs> Nothing. I wonder if you could even find those dang things anymore. I don't think you could even take a picture of the telescope in the dark. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, they, they, they still make those. I saw some when I was down in New Orleans a couple of years ago in a drugstore. And they're film, Tom? They, they were film. film. They were film. 